Welcome to the Voices of Bodybuilding podcast, episode two, the audio magazine devoted to fitness and bodybuilding and my mellifluous announcer voice. This week in the health and fitness section, we ask the question, do I shower too much? In the bodybuilding section, we explore intermittent fasting and its application or not to high level bodybuilding. Then Dave Pulsinella stops by to discuss the fake steroids flooding the underground market. According to him, almost nothing is real, kind of like the news you see on Facebook. And finally, our off-topic article is a philosophical look deep into Brazilian jiu-jitsu by a renowned and outspoken atheist. Stick around. I promise it'll be worth it. The views expressed in the articles are obviously the opinions of the writers and not me. I make no claims for the veracity of the information presented, so use your head and check these things out for yourself before trying anything you hear about on VOB. And if you've never exercised before, get started. It's never too late, but be sure to check with your doctor first to see if everything is okay, which you should be doing every year anyway. So this is an article from the You Asked section of Time.com, written by Markham Hyde, released in March of 2016. How often should I shower? Some people don't feel clean without a long, hot shower. But is a daily shower necessary, or even healthy? Quote, I think showering is mostly for aesthetic reasons, says Dr. Elaine Larson, an infectious disease expert and associate dean for research at Columbia University School of Nursing. Quote, people think they're showering for hygiene or to be cleaner, but bacteriologically, that's not the case. Larson's research has shown the antibacterial soaps and cleaning products many people use in their homes aren't any better than plain old soap at lowering the risk for infectious diseases. And when it comes to showering, all that scrubbing and exfoliating doesn't amount to much. Bathing will remove odor if you're stinky or have been to the gym, she says. But in terms of protecting you from illness, washing your hands regularly is probably adequate. Too much all-over bathing may even raise your risk for some health issues. Dry, cracked skin opens up gaps for infection-causing germs to slip through. That means frequent bathing when your skin is already dry, and especially as you age when your skin becomes thinner and less hydrated, may increase the odds of coming down with something, Larson says. Other experts agree. Quote, I think most people overbathe, says Dr. C. Brandon Mitchell, assistant professor of dermatology at George Washington University. Mitchell says washing can strip your skin of its natural oils and may also disrupt the skin's population of immune system-supporting bacteria. That's especially true of antibacterial cleansers, which both he and Larson recommend you ditch. More reason to skip the antibacterial soaps. Some research has linked triclosan, an ingredient found in many of these products, to potential health risks. So what's the ideal shower frequency? In terms of your health, not how you look or smell, probably once or twice a week, Mitchell says. Quote, your body is naturally a well-oiled machine, he says. Quote, a daily shower isn't necessary. People might not appreciate your natural musk, and that's no small concern. One recent study found smelliness ranks among the top relationship deal breakers. But as long as you're washing your hands and your clothing, which naturally rubs off and collects a lot of the dead cells and grime your body accumulates, you'd likely suffer no ill health effects, Larson says. Historically, bathing has fallen in and out of favor. Quote, the ancient Romans were a very bath-loving people, says Dr. Catherine Ashenberg, author of The Dirt on Clean and Unsanitized History. Quote, they typically frequented their amazing public baths once daily. Ancient Egyptians, and to a lesser extent ancient Greeks, were also big on baths, she says. But the fall of the Roman Empire wiped out the aquatic infrastructure that allowed many people access to fresh water for washing, Eschenberg says. The habit of bathing took another big hit during the 14th century when medical experts at the Sorbonne in Paris declared washing a health concern. Warm water opened pores, and so could increase a person's risk of contracting the bubonic plague they claimed incorrectly. A fear of hot water and bathing persisted for the next 500 years, Ashenberg says. Now, regular bathing is back in vogue. 
And if you really dig a daily shower, feel free to indulge if your skin feels healthy and hydrated. Water conservation arguments aside, of course. Quote, I tell patients who shower daily not to lather their whole bodies, Mitchell says. Hit your pits, butt, and groin, which are the areas that produce strong-smelling secretions. The rest of your body doesn't need much soaping, he says. Your hair is trickier. Quote, Some people with a dry scalp and hair probably only need to lather it every few weeks, Mitchell says. But even if you have dandruff or some other scalp issue that requires more frequent washing, a couple washes a week will suffice, he says. As with many articles of this type, it just sort of ends abruptly like that. Um, but I don't know. It would be hard for me to shower less, I think. Uh, maybe it's cultural, but I do go to the gym every day, and I feel like I need it. Um, however, I have begun just uh, hitting the highlights, as I call it, uh, face, pits, and privates, and saving the full body scrub for maybe twice a week. So far, no real changes in my skin tone that I can see, and no complaints from my girlfriend yet, so we'll uh, see what happens. There are a lot of muscle building and fat loss strategies floating around out there these days, and intermittent fasting has been claimed by many to be a great way to get lean. While that may be true for the average person, does intermittent fasting work for the competitive bodybuilder? Redcon One's contributing editor Alex Kickle wrote this article, which isn't just his opinion, but pulls from tons of scientific research. It's simply titled Intermittent Fasting. Now, Alex's title isn't that creative, but he makes up for it with a great article. I think it needs a good clickbait title, like um, maybe we could call it Donald Trump Tried Intermittent Fasting and You Won't Believe What Happened Next. With many diets coming into style and becoming popularized, one of the more recent dieting strategies is intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, or IF, has been around for quite some time, but as of late, many fitness and YouTube fitness personalities have adopted this way of dieting and began starting a trend. The purpose of this article is merely to point out the facts of what the literature says on IF at this current point in time, as well as my overall thoughts on how it can or cannot be applicable for a fitness-related competitor. Intermittent fasting is first and foremost a lean gains style of dieting, where you essentially have a brief window of time to consume all your calories and nutrients for the day. This time period is typically kept to six to eight hours, but can change depending on the person. The remaining hours of the day, you are kept in a fasted state. There is a fair amount of literature looking at intermittent fasting diets, so we should begin with one of the most extensive studies done correlating to IF. This study, Do Intermittent Diets Provide Physiological Benefits Over Continuous Diets for Weight Loss, a Systematic Review of Clinical Trials, was published in Molecular and Cellular Endocrinology by Simon et al. in 2015. This review incorporated 40 studies that looked at anyone who had recorded data that had undergone an intermittent style of energy-restrictive diet. Even though the study concluded with the researchers saying, quote, intermittent fasting thus represents a valid albeit apparently not superior option to continuous energy restriction for weight loss, end quote, that does not tell the full story of this study. If you look deeper into the 40 studies they discussed, you would find the fasting period ranged anywhere from hours to days to even looking at forms of energy restriction for weeks on and off. With this being an apparent flaw in the study design, we need to bring in some common sense and look at thermodynamics or calories in versus calories out. Essentially, any diet that is going to cause you to be in a negative energy balance will result in weight loss. The issue is, I am more interested in which dieting strategy is more optimal for retaining and gaining skeletal muscle tissue while oxidizing the most fatty acids. Even though this study looked at every variable from body weight to body composition, it still doesn't give us a practical look into how IF applies to a fitness competitor. As Simone's systemic review didn't give us any clear definition of how IF is applicable in our situations, 
we move deeper into the research, this time looking at a study from Tinsey and Labounty on the effects of intermittent fasting on body composition and clinical health markers in humans. Sadly, once again we see the same general conclusion that intermittent fasting does work, but that it cannot currently be determined whether or not it is superior to another form of dieting. Since both pieces of literature lead us to the same conclusion, we now need to take a step back and look purely at the possible benefits and drawbacks to intermittent fasting on its most basic level. Some of the proposed benefits to following an intermittent fasting style diet include increases in cellular turnover, fatty acid oxidation, growth hormone release, and metabolic rate. It is also said that it has the ability to reduce risks of cancer, oxidative stress, inflammatory markers, and blood pressure. Even furthermore, it is claimed to improve neurogenesis, blood sugar control, cardiovascular function, and appetite control. If you were just to read this, it would seem like IF is the best type of dieting hands down. But the issue with this is many of these benefits cannot be actualized within the fasting window people use. In fact, many of these take well over 20 hours of no food intake to actually become apparent. Even more so, if you look across many energy-restricted studies, you can see many of the same health markers and body composition changes occur. This brings up the big question I asked earlier about thermodynamics. Is it intermittent fasting causing all of the benefits, or simply the process of a reduced caloric intake? At this current time, I do not feel we have any conclusive pieces of literature pointing towards the fact that intermittent fasting is superior to traditional means of dieting, given both are in a caloric deficit. One thing I can say is my own personal opinion, given the literature we have available to us and actually applying to the whole picture of a fitness competitor. We will keep this simple and only bring up one small aspect, muscle protein synthesis. If we are fitness competitors, we are trying to carry the maximal amounts of lean tissue while simultaneously carrying as little body fat as possible. If that goal is agreed upon, then utilizing IF is essentially shooting yourself in the foot. When looking into protein distribution and meal timing literature, you'll see that every few hours, possibly within a two to five hour window, we have the ability to stimulate muscle protein synthesis via a high quality amino acid rich protein intake. Once your leucine threshold is met and rate limiting amino acids are taken into account, you essentially initiated mTOR and triggered muscle protein synthesis, ensuring that your body is kept in a more anabolic environment, favorable to muscular hypertrophy. If this process is not optimized, you simply will not be taking advantage of muscle protein synthesis and thus will not grow as efficiently as when compared to someone that does. With that simple aspect, you must make the decision for yourself if IF simply suits your lifestyle and works better because you're not a fitness competitor looking to maximize hypertrophy, or if you are a fitness competitor and are trying to find every possible advantage to grow that you can. Alex makes a compelling argument, and I would say that even for someone like me who is far from a fitness competitor and just an older guy looking to hold on to some muscle and stay as lean as possible. Intermittent fasting doesn't really make much sense. Um, I eat every three hours, uh, small meals throughout the day, and I, I love doing that. It's actually fun for me. I look forward to it. Um, and I feel like it keeps me in better shape and uh, helps me keep a little bit of uh, muscle on that I otherwise wouldn't have. And now the part of the podcast that you fast forward over all of the other stuff to get to, the segment where I invite my brother Dave to come on the show and, and just talk about whatever topics are on his mind. So Dave, what do you have for us this week? Dude, I, um, I found uh, last week's episode with Carl Lenore um, in that article. 
he had written about, you know, it's all gear. Oh, the one, it's called You Got That Body by Gear on superhumanradio.com. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I find him interesting and, and knowledgeable. I just, anything he puts out, I'll read uh, or listen to his podcast. Yeah, he's a smart guy and always fun to talk to. Really struck a chord with me. It's something that I've thought about so many times is how much credit can you really, can you really, and should you really give the gear? I think people who get on there, like he said, and say, uh, it's all gear. Right. Really, truly, truly, A, don't understand the process of becoming um, an amazing looking bodybuilder at the top of their game, right. the national or pro level. They have no idea what goes into it. So it's scary to them. The unknown scares them. But not only is it unknown, but there's another factor that you have to factor in, and that's the point that they've probably tried, in quotation marks, it, which means they did a half-assed version of what they thought they should do to get there, um, and it didn't happen for them. So there's resentment attached to it as well. They see this body, they don't understand it, they couldn't attain it on their own, so they have to attribute it to something that's maybe the one component they didn't do. Well, what are the reasons? What are the reasons that steroids might not work for a particular person? Is it, it really the individuation? I mean, I've heard you talk about before. You, there's certain people that it, they just their bodies just suck it right up, and others who it just doesn't seem to catch on with. Oh no, there is there is no one for whom steroids do not work. But let's put it this way: let's take each component of what it takes to become a great bodybuilder. Okay, one by one and remove that, right? Right. Let's say you were to just start weight training. You did nothing else, you changed nothing else, but you just added a progressive weight training program to your life. Will you experience physical changes? Will you get stronger? Yes. Of course. Will you experience maybe some uh, hypertrophy? Yes. Those things will happen as an initial reaction to just adding resistance training into your life. Even if you still have a bad diet? Yeah. Okay. Even if you still have a bad diet. Strength gains will happen. I've seen people who don't adjust their diet, um, don't know how to, start lifting and add 50 pounds to their bench All right. in, in a month. Obviously it happens, it's, it, it will work. So you can add that one component to your life and changes will occur. Mm -hmm. What if you just added the dietary component to your life? You don't do cardio, you don't lift, you just changed your diet. Will things happen to your body? Sure they will. If you're in a calorie deficit, you'll lose weight. If you increase the quality of the food, the fiber content, the quality of the proteins, you'll definitely experience a difference in your body, in the way it looks, in the way you feel, and what you weigh. That will definitely happen. Okay? And that's how most people do it. That's how most people in general, when they I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to lose weight, they change their diet, they usually eat less or eat salads or something like that. They'll either do that or they'll just add the workout part. What I see is more people just adding the exercise part without the diet. That's why they come to see me six weeks in when they hit their plateau and they're like, I know I need to do something with my diet now, I joined the gym. But, but that's people, yeah, but that's people who would go to the gym. I'm just talking about in general when oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. average person wants to try to lose weight. They, they, they eat less, they eat salads. Right. right. <laughs> they do the cliche, fruit, go to your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> oh, just go to your fruits and vegetables, just like that. So, yeah, so if you add weight training by itself, something will happen. If you add nutrition to your life, a good nutritional plan strategy, something will happen. If you just added cardio and nothing else to your life, would something happen? Sure, it would. Mm -hmm. increase, you would increase your, your, your level of uh, fitness, cardiovascular fitness, endurance. Uh, your oxygen uptake would improve. Your circulation would improve. You'd probably lose some weight. So yeah, something would happen if you just added that component. Now, let's take the steroids. If you just add steroids to your life and do nothing else, will you experience any results? No, you will not. Not at all? No, you will not. Nothing will happen. Nothing at all? Not really. Not really. No. Not even like water retention, bloating, that sort of thing? And if you're just taking something like D-ball, you might hold a little bit of water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
But nothing that's, you know, those other components by themselves will produce health, fitness, and aesthetic results. Right. Adding steroids by themselves will not. So these people who put the entire thing and they place it on a steroid or steroids in general and they say it's because of steroids. I think they're picking the one component that on its own will not do that. <laughs> now I'm not saying that you become a great bodybuilder, top level guy, national level pro without them. You cannot because bodybuilding as you've said so many times and I like the way you put it, it's a sport of you know uh, weight training, progressive resistance, nutrition, and hormonal manipulation. Wait, I was saying, no, I said it combines expert knowledge of physiology, nutrition, and chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said that better than me. <laughs> That's my job. That was better than what I just said. But I knew you said something like that. Um, but yeah, but it's true. So, I mean, I, I feel Carl's pain when he, when he gets on there and he sees, oh, gear, it's all gear. It's all gear. That is an ignorant person. That is someone who maybe has tried it and failed, is bitter, like steroids is for losers, that guy. Yeah. You know, his agenda comes from some dark, dark personal place. You think, you think steroids are for losers has tried steroids? He just looks like a regular, lumpy, melting, middle-aged guy. I think he refuses to. And I think they're in, and look, I'm guilty of this too. I remember when I was young and I was a bodybuilder coming up in the ranks and I remember thinking um, in the era of Dorian Yates, when he first came out, I was thinking and he ushered in the, the era of insulin and yeah. growth hormone. I remember thinking, look, I was at the junior nationals and there was these guys who just had these real full muscle bellies and um, like cartoon bubbly muscles and I just didn't have that. I remember thinking it's because they use growth. Hmm. I know it is, and I refuse to use growth. I too would have those bubbly muscles if I did growth, but I don't use growth and I refuse to. Well, time went on and I wanted to get to the next level and I decided I was gonna use growth. So I used growth and I still didn't have bubbly muscles like those guys. So it wasn't because I wasn't using growth. So then I said, well, you know, it's because I refuse to use insulin. <laughs> I used insulin like these guys. Yeah. I too would have those bubbly, full, uh, you know, cartoon bubble muscles. I know I would. And then of course I started using insulin and you know, it made a difference, but it didn't make me them. Nothing made me them because I'm not them. I picked the wrong parents and they picked the right ones. And it's just that simple. So no amount of drugs, and with this guy, I guarantee, Steroids are for losers, never used steroids. He, he never uh, went down that avenue, so he doesn't know what they can or cannot do. And he is being like I was when I was naive and young and thinking that they are responsible, completely responsible for these physiques. And I think that he, in his own bitterness, thinks that if he did them too, he would look like these guys. But the fact of the matter is, no, he would not. No, not He's, at all. Never know that. This is a little bit of a tangent, but the thing that cracks me up about him is that he feels like he's such a crusader and that he's undercover, uh, uncovering the lie, the secret, which at one point, yeah, no one was really talking about it. And there were videos produced that sort of covered it up. But today, there is so much information out there. Everyone's, I, there's like pictures, videos of guys actually injecting themselves on YouTube. It's not a secret anymore. You're not uncovering anything. Yeah, Boston Lloyd does his shots right on camera. I know. You know, I'm gonna teach everybody how to do this. <laughs> he doesn't care. Yeah, so it's not a secret, and he's, yeah, he's way out of time, he's way out of touch. Right. He just makes himself look pathetic. I know. But you know, it comes from a place of personal frustration. It always does. Well, every crusade comes from a place of personal frustration or some kind or an, of some kind or another. I mean, look at, you know, the, the strongest anti-homosexual crusaders, they always find them in a men's room, you know, blowing somebody. Right. They're running away from their own well, Right there. Look, and uh, who was the uh, the mayor of Washington D.C. had this this really strong anti drug campaign, right. and he was addicted to to crack cocaine at the time. It's their own demons that they're trying to. It's reflection of their own demons. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
True. But so, okay, so if if it's not steroid, if, if okay, I screwed up there. We're gonna we're gonna cut that and <laughs> we'll edit we'll edit there. I want to get into the underground steroid world and how nothing is is real. Yeah. Yeah. We want to take it from there. Um, um, how do how do we get into that? I don't know. You're the guy. You're you're the. Did you wait? Wait. Let me ask you this. Did you do you feel like you made your point? about steroids not being the only thing? Yeah, I just wanted to do that whole thing with the, you know, remove each component. One okay, one. all right, so I'll take it from there. Um, so definitely steroids are, you would agree, an integral part of taking you to the upper levels, right? That, that that's, a, that's a given. But it's certainly not the Absolutely. only thing that makes someone a bodybuilder. Absolutely, and it's not just use, it's abuse that gets you there too, unfortunately. It's like, yeah. it's yeah. like any other extreme sport. You think a pro wrestler is getting out of his career without a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. Ain't happening. Right. But here's the problem, and at least in the USA, um, they're illegal. And so you have to get them through underground yeah, means. Thing. Yeah. That's another thing. That's, that's been the tragedy in the steroid world, is the fact that they're illegal and they've been driven underground is the tragedy as far as I'm concerned. Because what it's done is it's put everyone at way, way, way more danger than they would have been had they still been able to get pharmaceutical grade stuff and use that. Because first of all, back in the day when we got pharmaceutical grade stuff, which mm -hmm. we did, everything when I started was real. No one had faked it yet. It was hard to get, but once you got it, you knew what you were getting was real. And back then, we could, you could actually get doctors to write prescriptions for you. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. Yes, there was a there was an old retired doctor who lived in a mansion in Springfield, Doctor Ravito, right? I don't, know, I don't know if you should give his name or not. Oh, dog, dude, he, he's long dead. Okay, this is, we're talking early ninety, late eighties, early nineties. Okay, and he was probably in his seventies then. So you do the math. <laughs> um, doctor Ravito was a retired doctor, and back by the way, back then it wasn't illegal. So what he was doing was not illegal. I see. Yeah. So what you would do is you would get a, if you got a prescription from a doctor for say, you know, Diana Ball or DECA or which you could get back then, uh, you could get a, a doctor to write you that prescription, testosterone, uh, whatever. Uh, then you could go to a pharmacy and you could fill it. So this Dr. Ravita, what he would do he was retired, but he would help the, the young athletes in the area. If you went to his house, you could just knock on his door. And I did this several times. He took you upstairs to a little room. He broke out his prescription pad, and he would basically say, all right, what do you, what do you need? He's like, um, can I get some Anadrol? Okay, 50 milligram Anadrol. And what else? Testosterone, how many milligrams? Uh, two, 200, 200 milligram testosterone, cypionate or propionate? Um, cypionate, cypionate, okay. You'd walk out of there with like three prescriptions. Wait, hold on, hold on a second, this is insane. So, is, is he giving you any advice on how to use this stuff or what you should be using at all? No. no. And, no. What, and what is he charging you to do this? You know, I think he charged a minimal fee. I remember he charged I don't know, I think I gave him a hundred bucks one time for the for the three scripts. Okay. I walked out and there were three scripts that had like four or five refills on them. It was amazing, dude, it was a different time. It was mm -hmm. a different time. The drugs were not viewed the way they are now, the way they ended up being in the in the early to mid 90s when they made it a schedule whatever, like um, like all the recreational drugs are. Why, why, that, did, why did they do that? I, your guess is as good as mine, maybe because they can't tax it, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theory type stuff, like they want to keep us weak and all that kind of bullshit. But yeah, I, know. I, I don't know if that's a, a real reason. I don't know. But it took a turn for the worse when that happened, because no, you could no longer do that. No doctor would touch that. And now the only thing you can do is if you're really, really in the know, and you know what website to go to or who to talk to, because what's happened, it, when, that first, when it first went underground, you could still get really good stuff from places that weren't here. Right. China. You could get growth hormone from China. I used to order 10 kits at a time. Uh, and they would send it to right to your door and it was real pharmaceutical grade stuff. Um, 
and people could make their own ordering the raw materials from China as well. Raw, they would get the powders. If you knew how to cook it and you know how to do the, the whole process, sterilization and put it in the oil and put it in the bottles and you knew how to do that, you can make your own stuff. Wow, and that was happening for a while. That's a lot of trouble, but I guess you would have a higher level of confidence. You, you would have that. a much higher level of confidence and accuracy with what you were using. You'd know what you were using uh, was what you thought you were in the amount that it was mm -hmm. and then it was dosed correctly. Those things are important. Now, you know, the, the problem has gone to the powders that you're ordering because now they've caught on and now all the powders are bogus. So you're ordering from China and what you're getting, you don't know if it's actual Masteron, if it's Primo, if it's testosterone, if it's whatever, uh, EQ. Um, you know, sometimes they just package testosterone, which is a cheaper powder as Masteron, which is a more expensive powder. So a person's doing, you know, a CC of test a week they think they're doing a CC of test, a CC of Masteron, and a CC of EQ every two days, right? All right. When actually they're doing three CCs of just testosterone every week, every time they do it three times a week, which is tragic because then you're going to end up with testosterone levels of 12,000 when you think you're doing an anabolic combined with test, combined with this thing that's supposed to do this thing and this thing that's supposed to do another thing and you're, you're trying to put together this cycle that's balanced in terms of the anabolics and in terms of the androgens and you think you have it right but what you're doing is just a bunch of tests or just some inert powder made into an oil and you're injecting that into your body or worst case scenario it's got some major major impurities in it and you're injecting that into your body has there been any cases where someone's gotten really sick from major impurities or it's not going to be something that they can pinpoint to the gear like when you're walking around with flu-like symptoms, yeah, who's going to say you don't have the damn flu? Right. You don't know if it's from you actually have the flu or is it something that's in the gear that you're taking. Of course, you can stop taking the gear and then the gear, the flu-like symptoms go away. So you put two and two together and you realize it's your gear. What's your recourse? What are you going to do? Right. Who are you going to tell? Oh, these steroids that I obtained illegally from China made me sick. <laughs> Go get them. With this? Yeah, there's no one to tell. There's no one to tell. All right, so we only have a couple more minutes in this segment. What can someone do about that if they want to be a high-level bodybuilder? Well, the higher the level you get to in the sport, the more inside you are. Mm. The more inside you are, the more you know the people who are getting the good stuff. But here's the problem with that too. You can have someone who's your source, who's getting really good powders from China or from wherever. Wait, who cares? Doesn't hmm. matter, right? Yeah. So they have this good source. They order the first batch. They're a master on, they test it out, it's master on. They test out their Primo powder, it's Primo. They test the test, it's test. They test out everything, it all tests out to what it's supposed to be. They make their stuff out of this powder that is what it's supposed to be. They have some good gear, it's labeled correctly, it's dosed correctly, you got a good source. However, that can change because the guy that your source yeah. is getting the powders from can and often does use the bait and switch where the first shipment they send you is all good stuff because they know you're going to test it. It's all good. It's all accurate. It is what it's supposed to be. You have it tested. You start making the stuff. Then you place your second order. Right. And they send you a bunch of shit thinking or knowing that you won't test it again because you think you got a good source. I'm trying to help my audience here and come up with some kind of a definitive answer, but it doesn't sound like there is one. It's really difficult, bro. And this is the problem. Anytime you drive something underground, you drive it into the hands of the unsavory. Well, see, that's, that's the problem with the the whole war on drugs in the first place. In the first place. Don't want to get real political on this, but if when when you cease the war on drugs, you will pull the rug out from under these drug cartels. It's it's and it's so ironic because when you were able to get real stuff in the '90s, late '80s. Your risk to benefit ratio was so much different than it is now. Yeah. Your risks are so much higher and it has nothing to do with the dangers intrinsic in steroids themselves. 
It has to do with what is in that bottle that you just ordered. What the fuck is really in it? Because if it was what it says it's supposed to be, your risks would be minimal. You'd know what you're putting into your body. You can adjust the dosage. You can get blood work done to see where you are occasionally and everything would be great. But no, that's not the way it is and it never will be again. Unless we get it legalized. Yeah, how's that gonna happen? <laughs> how's that gonna happen? Not bloody likely. Not bloody likely. But therein lies the danger. I mean, it's tough. You have to know where you're going and then you have to constantly monitor each shipment that comes in so you know they're not doing the bait and switch. So it's the kind of thing where it's ever vacillating. It's never the same. You can't be like, whew, I got a good source there. So now I can have that source forever. You just don't know. It can switch at any time. Wow. Well, on that depressing note, I'm going to say to everyone, be really careful and do your best to uh, check your sources, I guess. I don't know what else to say. Well, you know, Dave Palumbo is actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, rep one of his products. Dave Palumbo, and this is brilliant, he's come up with uh, testing kits that you can buy from him on his website. Excellent. And uh, you can test your stuff when it comes in uh, and it reacts with the reagent in the whatever and it turns a certain color so you know that if it turns this color, it's that compound. If it turns this color, it's that compound. So you know actually what you have is what you have. Oh, that's excellent. Well, now Dave owes me for that advertisement. <laughs> right. All right, thanks, Dave. I'll talk to you next week. Got it. See ya. The off-topic article for this week is a blog post by the outspoken atheist slash philosopher Sam Harris. If you aren't familiar with him, Sam is known for his outspoken criticism of religion, and if you are a doubter like me, you will certainly enjoy him. Or even if you ever feel the need to challenge your faith, you might want to check out his books and YouTube videos. He's very interesting, controversial, you can disagree with him, whatever, but he's always interesting. However, this article has nothing to do with religion. Sam recently took up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and has become a self-described junkie for the sport. Now, I haven't tried BJJ myself, but I have shot footage of Jiu-Jitsu training, and it really is a fascinating sport that combines intellect and physicality. In this blog, Harris applies his famous brain to his experiences and gets characteristically philosophical about it. The Pleasures of Drowning by Sam Harris on the samharris.org website. After writing an article on the principles of self-defense, I was inundated with emails and internet comments, many of which came from experts in the field. The response was very supportive, and I haven't found anything of substance to amend in my original essay. However, I did take one criticism to heart. I don't know enough about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I am now doing my best to rectify that problem. What follows is the first installment of what I hope will be an ongoing journal of my progress in BJJ. I suspect that many readers of this blog have no interest in the martial arts and will consider this an unfortunate departure from my main areas of competence. I am convinced, however, that training in BJJ offers a powerful lens through which to examine some primary human concerns truth versus delusion, self-knowledge, ethics, and overcoming fear. I hope some of you bear with me. Martial artists are often slow to appreciate how their beliefs about human violence can be distorted by their adherence to tradition, as well as by a natural desire to avoid injury during the course of training. It is, in fact, possible to master an ancient fighting system and to attract students who will spend years trying to emulate your skills without ever discovering that you have no ability to defend yourself in the real world. Delusions of martial prowess have much in common with religious faith. A crucial difference, however, is that while people of faith can always rationalize apparent contradictions between their beliefs and the data of their senses, an inability to fight is very easy to detect and, once revealed, very difficult to explain away. There may be no case more perplexing or egregious than that of Yanagi Ryukin, a purported master of Aikido. Master Ryukin apparently believed himself capable of defeating multiple attackers 
without deigning to touch them. Rather, he could rely upon the magic power of Qi. Videos of him demonstrating his devastating ability shows that his students were grotesquely complicit in what must have been a long and colorful process of self-deception. Did these young athletes actually think they were being hurled to the ground against their will? It's hard to know. What seems certain, however, is that Master Ryukin came to believe that he was invincible. Otherwise, he wouldn't have invited a martial artist from another school to come and test his powers. What follows in the blog post are two videos where you can actually see the master in action, defeating his students without touching them, and then the belated encounter with physical reality, as Sam puts it, when he gets pretty much beat up by another uh, martial artist. Of course, it is sad to see a confused old man repeatedly punched in the face. But if you are a martial artist, or have even a passing concern with safeguarding basic human sanity, you will take some satisfaction in seeing a collective delusion so emphatically dispelled. Just think what must have been going through the minds of Master Ryukin's students as they witnessed this performance. Unfortunately, a similar form of self-deception can be found in most martial artists because almost all training occurs with some degree of partner compliance. Students tend to trade stereotyped attacks in a predictable sequence, stopping to reset before repeating the drill. This staccato pattern of practice, while inevitable when learning a technique for the first time, can become a mere pantomime of combat that does little to prepare a person for real encounters with violence. Another problem is that many combative techniques are too dangerous to perform realistically, such as gouging the eyes or striking the groin. As a result, students are merely left to imagine that these weapons decisively end a fight whenever deployed in earnest. Reports from the real world suggest otherwise. These concerns make BJJ and other grappling arts unique in two ways. BJJ can safely be practiced under conditions of 100% resistance, and therefore any doubts or illusions about its effectiveness can be removed. Striking-based arts can also be performed under full resistance, of course, but not safely, because getting repeatedly hit in the head is bad for your health. And whatever the intensity of training, it is difficult to remove uncertainty from the striker's art. Not even a professional boxer can be sure what will happen if he hits an assailant squarely on the jaw with a closed fist. The other man might fall to the ground unconscious, or he might not, and without gloves the boxer might break his hand on the first punch. By contrast, even a novice at BJJ knows beyond any doubt what will happen if he correctly applies a triangle choke. It is a remarkable property of grappling that the distance between theory and reality can be fully bridged. I can now attest that the experience of grappling with an expert is akin to falling into deep water without knowing how to swim. You will make a furious effort to stay afloat, and you will fail. Once you learn how to swim, however, it becomes difficult to see what the problem is. Why can't a drowning man just relax and tread water? The same inscrutable difference between lethal ignorance and life-saving knowledge can be found on the mat. To train in BJJ is to continually drown, or rather, to be drowned in sudden and ingenious ways, and to be taught again and again how to swim. Whether you are an expert in a striking-based art, boxing, karate, taekwondo, etc., or just naturally tough, a return to childlike humility awaits you. Simply step onto the mat with a BJJ black belt. There are few experiences as startling as being effortlessly controlled by someone your size or smaller, and despite your full resistance, placed in a chokehold, an arm lock, or some other submission. A few minutes of this, and whatever your previous training, your incompetence will become so glaring and intolerable that you will want to learn whatever this person has to teach. Empowerment begins only moments later, when you are shown how to escape the various traps that were set for you, and to set them yourself. 
Each increment of knowledge imparted in this way is so satisfying, and one's ignorance at every stage so consequential, that the process of learning BJJ can become remarkably addictive. I have never experienced anything quite like it. Most students of the martial arts have been aware of BJJ for years, since its emergence in the Ultimate Fighting Championship in 1993. The UFC was the first series of mixed martial arts tournaments to get serious attention. The great novelty of these events is that they allow any style of fighting to be pitted against any other. Combatants from all disciplines, karate, boxing, Greco-Roman wrestling, Muay Thai, Kung Fu, Judo, Taekwondo, Sambo, kickboxing, Sumo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, etc. are simply placed in a ring or at the UFC in an octagonal cage, in pairs. In the first years of the UFC, there were no weight divisions, no rounds or time limits, and very few rules. In fact, there were no judges because every fight ended by knockout, submission, referee stoppage, or a fighter's corner throwing in the towel. Many people found the resulting spectacle horrifying, a modern version of the Roman games. But to the martial arts community, the first UFC events were a science experiment that had been centuries in the making. Finally, there would be an answer to the one question of perennial interest to fighters everywhere. What is the best method of fighting? After a few hours, the answer seemed clear. And it wasn't boxing, wrestling, karate, or kung fu. Whatever a man's size, strength, skill, and prior training, a relatively diminutive practitioner of BJJ, Royce Gracie, could completely dominate him. This revelation has acquired a few caveats in recent years, but two decades of pressure testing has confirmed its essential truth. In the absence of rules, fighters of all styles tend to defensively grab hold of each other and grapple vertically. The significance of this clinch is disguised in sports like boxing, and kickboxing because the referee repeatedly separates the two combatants. In the UFC, or in a real fight, the clinch tends to persist, often with the result that the bigger, stronger person, or the more experienced wrestler, takes his opponent to the ground. Once a fight goes to the ground, there is no substitute for knowing BJJ. Today, more or less everyone training in MMA has absorbed this lesson so the advantage of having a BJJ pedigree has been nullified. Martial artists from every discipline have added BJJ to their arsenals, and while the difference between being good at BJJ and being great can still be decisive, the fact that all competitors have good grappling skills has changed the character of the sport. Everyone now understands that the laws of physics dictate a right answer to the question what is the best method of fighting? And all MMA fighters now do their best to embody it. When you are standing at arm's length from your opponent, you want to be able to punch like a Western-style boxer and kick like a Thai boxer. Moving closer, you want to remain a Thai boxer in your ability to strike with your knees and elbows. Once your opponent grabs hold of you, or you him, the clinch, you want to have the skills of a Greco-Roman freestyle wrestler, controlling his posture and throwing him to the ground at will. In the presence of sufficient clothing, jackets, coats, or traditional martial arts uniforms, this vertical grappling can take the form of judo. The general picture at this range is of two people being too close to strike one another effectively. You want to be the one who can move the fight to the ground on his own terms by executing takedowns or throws and who can resist being taken there. And if the fight goes to the ground, the surest path to the safety of home remains Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. The original revelation of the UFC still stands with the coda that since everyone has now learned the same skills, an ability to strike on the ground has grown more important in MMA. Whether one practices BJJ by name doesn't necessarily matter, because other arts teach similar techniques, submission wrestling, sambo, etc. But no other discipline has mapped the frontiers of ground fighting the way BJJ has. 
From a self-defense perspective, practicing BJJ exclusively can introduce one dangerous habit. Because BJJ is geared toward fighting on the ground and is so decisive there, you can easily acquire a bias toward going to the ground on principle. When rolling on the mat, perfecting arm locks and chokes, it is easy to forget that in a real fight, your opponent is very likely to be punching you, or armed with a weapon, or in the company of friends who might be eager to kick you in the head, facts that are given cursory treatment in most BJJ training. To spend years perfecting the art of ground fighting is to risk forgetting that if a fight starts, the last place you want to be is on the ground. To study BJJ for self-defense, therefore, is to prepare for the worst-case scenario. But the worst case remains a high probability in any sudden encounter with violence. If you are ever attacked by a bigger, stronger person, there's a very good chance you will find yourself on the ground wrestling in some form. The difference between knowing what to do in this situation and merely relying on your primate intuitions is as impressive a gap between knowledge and ignorance as I have ever come across. Thanks for listening to Voices of Bodybuilding. Just a reminder that you can send me articles to be considered for this podcast at mike at mikepulsanella.com. They can be articles you find or pieces you write yourself. So till next time, stay active and stay healthy. Stay healthy.